So thank you very much to all the patients and families and friends uh, for coming. Special thank you to Dr. Feldman for organizing this, for the Women of Courage yeah. and the Lupus Foundation. Um, and uh, I think this reminds me of how little time we can give in the office to answering your questions and educating you properly. And so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about some of the many questions that you have and the organizers for putting this together this afternoon and helping to address the many concerns and questions uh, that you have. Um, these are disclosures and this is because of some of the work I do related to research that works with pharmaceutical companies and some of the invitations that I've received as well. So what I'd like to talk with you today about is about the treatment of lupus, some of the trials. And what I, what I do uh, is I, in my work, I see a lot of patients with a lot of different diseases, one of which is lupus. So I see a lot of patients with lupus. That's about 80%, 75 to 80% of what I do. And the other 25% of the time, I spend doing clinical trials of new drugs or drugs for the treatment of lupus. And one day, I hope to be in front of you and say that we have the drug that's going to make the <coughs> biggest difference for any manifestation of lupus. And I hope in the course of my lifetime that I'll be able to say that uh, to you. And we're getting there, so things are better but they're nowhere near where we want them to be. When we think about a disease like rheumatoid arthritis, which is one of the other diseases that I treat in, in our rheumatology clinic, and in rheumatoid arthritis, in the last 18 years, we've made huge, huge, huge strides uh, in improvements in the treatment. So in our clinics, we used to see patients used to get a lot of joint replacements and use walkers and wheelchairs for rheumatoid arthritis. We see that much less often now. And in lupus, we haven't made as much progress, but as I said, we've made steps towards achieving that goal. Um, and so what I'm going to speak with you today about some of the treatments of lupus that are around and some of the trials that, that I've done or that we're doing. So, so lupus is, what we, is an autoimmune disorder. It's the prototypic means it's, an, it's a, an example of the autoimmune disorder that's out there. There are a lot of other autoimmune diseases. You've heard of diabetes. Diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Psoriasis is an autoimmune disease. Hypothyroidism is an example of another autoimmune disease. But lupus is the like model autoimmune disease where the immune system, the immune system does a lot of different things. It protects us against infection, but at the same time, it also participates the immune system in how diseases are expressed. And in lupus, like Dr. Leatherworth was saying, the, auto, the immune system is revved up. It's hyperactive. It's, it, there's too much of it going on. And, and then the immune system, uh, uh, the, the act overactive immune system can, is expressed differently in different people with lupus. But everyone with lupus, 99% nine, uh, of them have a positive ANA, this anti-nuclear antibody where you're making antibodies against part of the nucleus or part of the cell. But not everyone with a positive ANA has lupus. So about 40% of the normal population, so if I took 100 people out there and we measured the ANA in 100 people randomly in the population, about 40 of them would test positive for ANA, but that doesn't mean that 40% of them have lupus. But the ANA is seen in 99% of patients with lupus. So, if you don't, so that's, that's one of those criteria that Dr. Leatherward talked about and that I'll mention again. And as we've heard lots of times today, it's predominantly a female disease, and it tends to affect certain ethnic groups more than others. It tends to affect patients of African descent, patients of Asian descent, and patients of Hispanic descent, but also patients of Caucasian descent. So it can affect many, many different ethnic groups. And in a clinical trial, okay, so we try to test a new drug, we might want to know what the ANA status is of the patient. We want them all to be ANA positive, okay? We want them to have that ANA because that's the hallmark of the autoimmune disease. We also want to understand their ethnic groups or their background because the disease might be differently expressed in different people, okay? So in a trial, we look at all those different aspects of the illness. And then the other thing that I'll talk to you about a trial, so lupus comes in lots of different flavors, right? Some patients here might have just skin disease. Some patients might have heart disease. Some patients might have both skin and heart disease. Some patients might have kidney disease and heart disease. <coughs> and in a lupus trial, we tend to group patients into two categories. One is what we call general lupus, so that might be skin, the heart, and stuff. And then we have kidney lupus that we put in a completely different category because we treat them differently. 
But in that group of general lupus, we have lots of different types. And the challenge is how to find a drug to treat all those different types of lupus in that general category, and also how to treat the kidney disease. So let, let me just kind of remind us of some facts about lupus, okay? So this is what we call prevalence status, like how much is there at this particular time of a disease. So this looked at, this was published in the uh, late 1990s, it looked at about 250,000 Americans who had lupus at that particular time. And of the 250,000 patients or so, most of the patients were black women. The next most common group of white women, then the next most common group of black men, and the least common group are white men. So it's still, this reminds us, it's predominantly a disease of black women, but also black men and white women, okay? And least common white men. Now in my practice, I have somewhere around 200 patients with lupus, and I probably have under 50 that are men, okay? White men. So we're doing better with lupus, okay? So it used to be that the prognosis, how a patient did over time, was not so good, but much, much, much better. So we've made lots of progress in the last few years. So the one message of hope that I'd like to leave all of you with today is that we're doing better, and my expectation is we'll continue to do better. And let me show you why I'm saying that, okay? So this is, says survival at five years, okay? So how many patients survived at five years? And then how many patients survived at 10 years? And on the left-hand side here, all the different studies that have examined how long do patients, live, do patients live for five years or do patients live for beyond 10 years after the diagnosis? So this was a study done in the 1950s. These were studies done in the 1980s. This in the 1990s, okay? So what you can see here is that in the 1950s and 1970s, patients lived maybe at five years. 51% of patients lived beyond five years. 70% lived beyond five years. But we look now, 95% are living beyond five years, and over 85 to 88% are living over 10 years. So the survival of the disease in the last, of patients with the disease in the last 15 to 20 years has gotten much better, okay? Very important. So why is that? And why do patients sometimes die from lupus? We see a lot less of that now, but patients, you know, can pass away. We want to prevent that, obviously, okay? And what are, what are the, oops, what are the re reasons for that? Why, why is the mortality rate, why is the death rate so much better now than it was 20 years ago? One is we're much, much better at kidney disease. One of the patients here today spoke about kidney disease, but we're much better at kidney disease. We've also gotten a lot better about how to figure out what treatments work best in patients, okay? And also dialysis is a lot better now than it used to be, okay? Um, but the long-term risk of dying from the disease is still kidney disease, infection, and like Drs. Leatherward and Burmis spoke about earlier, and heart disease, okay? So stopping smoking is really important. Exercise is really important. Making sure your cholesterol is really is important. The other thing that's really important that we know, we've learned two things, Dr. Leatherworth and Dr. Burmis both spoke about this. We know steroids work, right? So for those patients who've taken steroids, they generally work in helping the disease get better. But if, so if steroids didn't have side effects, we wouldn't be having, we wouldn't worry about treating lupus because it, it generally works. The problem with steroids are all the side effects many of you talked about here today. The fatigue, the, the weight gain, the change in appearance, the mood changes, the cataracts, yeah. So a lot, risk of infection was another one that's really important. So the major goal of treatment is to make sure we keep patients living for a really long time and really minimize the steroid use. Because if we could use steroids without any side effects, we wouldn't have so many problems. The problem is that we have a lot of steroid-related side effects. So a lot of the clinical research studies of new drugs are aimed at trying to minimize the steroids that we use in patients with lupus, okay? Um, so as I said earlier, this is a flat slide I borrowed from Dr. Koskenbader about 10 years ago. Um, so lupus comes in many different flavors, okay? <laughs> So there's, sometimes patients have blood involvement. Sometimes patients have a lot of miscarriages and blood clots called the antiphospholipid syndrome. Some of you may be taking aspirin or Coumadin if you've had a blood clot or a lung clot, uh, a lung clot uh, uh, um, to your lungs. Some people may have what's called brain fog or can't think straight. Um, 
And then there's arthritis. Uh, some patients might have just kidney disease, and some people might have a little bit of everything. So every person comes with a different flavor, and our job is to figure out wh where the patient fits. And then in the clinical studies, you have to kind of figure out which category the patient fits in, and then try to figure out what treatment should be a applied or prescribed for that particular group of patients. So Dr. Leatherward talked about these criteria. Okay, and so these, I just want to remind you that there are all these different criteria that we use to make the diagnosis of lupus, okay? Um, and the clinical studies will use these criteria in, in, in lupus. Now, um, I'm going to skip over this one. So how do we figure out what treatment to use in a patient, okay? And I could say this for pretty much every disease that's out there, okay? Um, one is what's called anecdotal data. You try something, and if it works in that patient, great. But it's not, that's based on my experience. I'll say, well, gee, I saw um, Mr. Jones yesterday, and, and um, you know, he had uh, arthritis, and uh, he wasn't doing well in a particular medicine. And I said, well, gee, I saw a patient that looked like Mr. Jones six months ago, and I used that medicine. Maybe I'll try this that in this patient yesterday. And that's called anecdotal data, trial and error. Then the other way we learn how to give a patient treatment is through the published literature. Okay, so there might be observational studies or epidemiologic studies, and this is what Dr. Feldman and Dr. Kostenbader do in our lupus center. They do a lot of these epidemiologic and observational studies. So, for example, the Rock, Roxbury Lupus uh, Project was, 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 was an observational uh, study. So you look at um, a group of patients and try to see, well, what's the smoking rate in that population, and did, was that associated with with the incidence of lupus. So the literature can give us some information with uh, the anecdotal data experience, but clinical trials remain the best way to determine if a drug is going to work in a group. And in a clinical trial, a pa and Dr. Rao is going to be speaking to you a little bit about this, a patient enters a trial, uh, they get treated with a drug or placebo or a drug against another drug, so oftentimes they won't know what they're getting, and then at the end of the trial, uh, the, the groups are compared with one another, the group that got the drug versus the group that didn't get the test drug, to see whether there's a difference in the treatment. And it takes a lot of courage and a lot of work to be part of a clinical trial. And Dr. Rao will be speaking to you a little bit about that because you have to take time out of work or your life. You have to kind of have more blood work than you, done than you ordinarily would get done. And, and you're, but you're also, the, the, the great part about it is that you're part of a team and you're contributing to something. And some people get a lot of gratification from knowing they're contributing to something. But it does take a lot of courage and a lot of time. So when we're trying to decide on a, you know, a clinical trial so or in a treatment, we try to identify the organ system involved, whether it's the skin, the joint, the kidney, heart and lungs, or the blood system. And then we kind of figure out, well, do we have clinical trials that help us figure out what treatment to use in that patient? Is there literature that I can go back to, you know, in the observational trials or other studies that have been published? Or can I speak to my other physician friends and ask their advice about what they've done? And one of the great things about working at the Brigham Lupus Center is that we have so many doctors that we work with that when I have a patient that I can't figure out what to do with, we, I present them to, I, I call it's called a presentation. I, I go to a conference. We have three, three or four conferences a week, and I'll ask my friends, you know, I've got a patient and I'm not really sure what to do. What do you think about this? And I present the case. So that the patient not only is seeing me, I kind of feel like they have the benefit of seeing seven or eight other experienced doctors. And that's one of the beauties of the Lupus Center at, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So let, let me kind of go through the treatment of lupus, okay? So here on this column here is the drug. This is when the study was done. So this, was, uh, this is a group of patients studied between 1950 and 1979. And this is a group of patients between 1980 and 1992, okay? Drug, 1950 to 1979, 1980 to 1992. And then we look at steroids, that's like prednisone or medrol, okay? And then antimalarials, that's like plaquenil or chloroquine. And then cyclophosphamide is cytoxin. Azathioprine, the other word for that is imuran. And then an, an example of an other immunosuppressor would be something like Celsept, okay? That you may have heard of all those drugs. Okay, so if we look at in 19, between 1950 and 1979, 62% of this group were taking steroids compared to 48% later. So what we've learned is that it looks like 
people are using less steroids. Okay, so in the 1950s to 1970s, it was 62% compared to 48%. And then anti-malarials, it looks like it's going up from 14% to 48%. So over time, over the decades, we're using less steroids. We're using more plaquenil, okay? We're using less of the cyclophosphamide or cytoxan, using less of that imuran, and probably more of that cell sept. So that's the general trend. And why is that? Well, we've learned, you've told us here today, reminded us, people get terrible side effects from steroids. We're trying to use them less. I'm going to talk to you a bit about plaquenil in a minute. We're using much more plaquenil because of the benefits of plaquenil. We're using less cytoxan because we know the side effects of cytoxan. And we're using more of CELSEPT because of the benefits of CELSEPT. And we've learned all of those things from trial and error and from the clinical studies that we've done of, of patients using cytoxan for lupus or CELSEPT. Okay? So um, in 2015, okay, uh, and these, this is what we used for, this is what we call the standard of care for lupus. So, so those of you who are in the audience who have lupus or have family members with lupus probably are taking or have taken one of the medicines on this list, okay? So we've talked about the anti-malarials, which we use for skin disease or uh, blood problems. That's what dyscrasia means. Musculoskeletal systems, we joint systems. And then steroids, pretty much we use a lot of, but we want to minimize use. Imuran, methotrexate, Areva or leflunamide. 6-MP, we don't use as much. We use more liver disease, cyclophosphamide, MMF is cytoxin. And then the drug that was approved in March of 2011, five, actually five years ago last week, was something called Benlista or Belimumab. Uh, and that, this is the first bio, what we call biologic treatment that was approved for lupus. Okay. So I do, like I said, I do a lot of lupus trials. And when I, when, I, when, you, when I do lupus trials, I try to think of three things when I'm doing lupus trials, okay? So I think of the drug that's being measured. So I'm going to show you a triangle here and a little bit of a, of a, of a drug study. So we have this triangle. We look at the drug. <coughs> Population means what kind of lupus patients did we study in this, in this trial? Were the patients of a certain ethnic group predominantly? Or do they all have kidney disease? Or were they all skin disease or joint disease? So what was the group of patients that we studied in this study? Okay. What was the drug that was used? And then how do we figure out whether the drug worked in this study? And that's called the tool, okay? So the drug, the group of people that were tested, and then how do we figure out whether they, the drug worked or not? That's the tool. Okay. So the one drug I bet many of you are taking or have taken or learned or family members have taken for, for lupus is Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. How many of you heard of Plaquenil? Or, yeah. All right, so pretty much everyone here. I've, I've, Prescribe it like water, um, <laughs> at any rate, okay? And why do we do that? What, what would be the, why are the majority of people in this room raise their hand and are taking hydroxychloroquine? Why are the, all the physicians that you've heard from today probably prescribe hydroxychloroquine for all their lupus patients? We learned that based on a clinical trial. That's how we learned to prescribe hydroxychloroquine for you or your loved one, okay? So how do, how do we figure that out? Okay, so this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about 25 years ago. So this is based on data that, that was published, you know, like I said, 25 years ago, but we were probably using hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil before 1991. But this kind of, when it gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine, it kind of, it's the big stamp of approval, um, you know, for most physicians. That's kind of like the Bible, you know? Um, or, Something like the Bible. Um, <laughs> at, at any rate, so what was the drug again? Remember the triangle I talked with you about? So the drug is hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, okay? So that was the drug that was studied here. And the population of patients, these are patients 47, there were 47 patients, and these are patients who had stable disease. They all had lupus. They all had four out of those 11 criteria that Dr. Leatherwood was speaking about. So there wasn't any question about the diagnosis. They all had stable disease, and all of them were taking Plaquenil. And the, or the people who published the study said, well, gee, if we take 47 of these patients with lupus and we bring them into the study and they're all taking Plaquenil, how about if we ask half of them not to, t to stop their Plaquenil and the other half of them to continue it? And the question being, does Plaquenil prevent a flare? That's the question. So 
Otherwise, we were just giving Plaquenil to people based on, gee, Dr. Maserati tried Plaquenil and Mr. Smith, that seemed to work. Dr. Burmis spoke with Dr. Maserati and they talked and, they said, and Dr. Burmis said, gee, I think I'm going to try that on Mr. Smith too, or vice versa, okay? So in that particular case now, so what, was, what happened at the end of six months, what was found was that the, plaque, the people who were in the group that continued the Plaquenil had fewer flares than the group of patients that, stopped the, that didn't take the Plaquenil for the course of the study. And a clinical study helped to answer that question. And it's on the basis of that study that physicians now routinely recommend hydroxychloroquine for, for most patients with lupus to prevent flares in lupus. And Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, is FDA approved, so the federal government has said it, this is FDA approved for the treatment of lupus. Okay? So that's an example of a successful study in lupus for general lupus. These are patients who had joint disease predominantly. Okay? Now, after this landmark study in, in, that was published in 1991, we've learned a lot of other things about Plaquenil. So there are a lot of other reasons why many of you should be taking Plaquenil, or continue to take Plaquenil, why your rheumatologist probably suggested that you continue to have, taking one, it prevents flares, okay? The other thing is that it can be used safely in pregnancy. So Dr. Burmis has a special interest in uh, lupus patients with pregnancy, and she can tell you that she's probably continued Plaquenil in patients with lupus many, many, many times without any problems with the fetus for the most part. And I, I myself have done that as well. There's also some evidence that it lowers glucose and patient glu blood sugars in patients with lupus who have diabetes. There's an effect of Plaquenil with that. And then uh, there's also been an effect on improving cholesterol levels in patients with lupus who take Plaquenil. So there are some other benefits to Plaquenil that I'd encourage you to speak with your physicians about. But most, most of us will prescribe Plaquenil for all of our patients with lupus, okay? unless there's a reason not to. Um, so what are the side effects? Most people tolerate it really well, the overwhelming majority. Some people get a little diarrhea from it, about 1% can get a rash, like you get a rash with penicillin. And then the rare side effect is, is with the eye, and that's extremely rare. It can cause irreversible retinal damage, but it's very, very rare, and the risk is usually about uh, 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 3% in patients taking Plaquenil for over 10 years above the recommended uh, dose for your weight, okay? So that's, so it's rare. Mm -hmm. So, but we ask you to have your eyes checked regularly by an ophthalmologist. So your rheumatologist will be asking you about that, uh, about making sure your eyes have, have been checked, okay? Um, so lots of other drugs are used to treat lupus, okay? So we talked about things like Motrin and Advil, <laughs> can be used to treat some joint pain. Um, we talked about Plaquenil, steroids we mentioned, methotrexate we use lots of times for joint disease, uh, leflunamide or Areva we use for joint disease, mycophenolate mofotil is something we use for lupus nephritis or kidney disease now is the number one uh, drug that we use for lupus nephritis. And then we also just mentioned what we've learned in studies of patients with kidney disease who have lupus nephritis is that certain ethnic groups respond differently to MMF, to this drug cell set, than other ethnic groups. So we know in patients who have kidney disease related to lupus, people of African descent or black descent seem to do better with MMF than people who are non-blacks. Non Cyclophosphamide we've also used. And then belimumab, which is Benlisla, uh, was FDA approved about, as I said, five years ago. And it's approved for patients with general lupus, but not people who have brain disease related to lupus, or people have kidney disease related to lupus, okay? Um, so tri clinical trials. So I do both trials in rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, we've been like, you, you know, um, there are tons of treatments we can offer RA patients these days based on all the trials that have been done by my colleagues and other people across the country and in the world. But there are big differences between RA and lupus, okay? So RA is, first of all, it's, it's much more common than lupus. Um, RA patients look more like one another than lupus patients. So if I took 100 of my RA patients, they probably look more alike. They have a lot more joint, they all have joint disease. Whereas if I took 100 of my lupus patients, some of them might just have skin, some of them just might have heart, some of them might have heart, liver, and, uh, heart, liver and kidney. 
Um, and, uh, and the diagnosis is a little easier in rheumatoid arthritis than it is in lupus. So there were lots of differences between the two. <coughs> um, and then I just wanted to kind of go over um, sort of where we are with some new treatments for, for lupus. Um, there are, this is a, 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 an example of the immune system and the cells involved in the immune system. Um, there are T cells and B cells involved in the immune system. B cells make antibodies, okay? And antibodies are overproduced in patients with lupus. So some of the treatments that have been developed, like rituximab, work against this B cell and reduce antibody formation, okay? And there are other drugs that are being directed at um, proteins that affect how B cells are being produced in the body. Okay. But so rituximab, we thought, would be a big success in the treatment of lupus because, as I said, the B cell produces antibodies, and rituximab works on this <laughs> particular part of the B cell. But what was found is that the rituximab didn't work very well at all for lupus, for most manifestations of lupus. It does seem to work well for some very specific manifestations of lupus, but not for the, what we thought would be global or general lupus. Okay. Um, and, uh, and right now, our, our division is looking at um, something called a batacept or Rencia for people with kidney disease with lupus. And there are other studies we're starting in the next few months. But I think that I remain hopeful that with continued research with people like Dr. Rao in our, in our group um, and others in the country and in the world that we'll find the particular combination of therapies that'll work in lupus. My own sense is that it's not gonna be one drug like it is in rheumatoid, in rheumatoid arthritis. Some patients may only need just one medicine. I think in lupus, because it comes in so many different flavors, that we're gonna need different things, drugs to attack different parts of the body for, in a patient with lupus. But I'll stop there and I'll take a question for a couple of minutes and then I'll be in the breakout session. Um, and uh, okay, I'm gonna stop there.